Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're talking all about induction. So <clears throat> what induction is and ways that we can use induction to prove that statements are correct. So this is a pretty solid topic. It's I, I would say it's one of the more challenging ones. And because of that, I'm going to try to take this video a little bit slower than I usually do, but definitely please feel free to slow down to pause the video, ask as many questions as you need on our discussion boards or anything like that. Just, <clears throat> excuse me, do what you need to do in order to understand what's going on here. Because induction is such a cool and useful tool for us. It's really something extremely powerful. So it'll be extremely help for you, helpful for you as the time goes on. Um, so uh, likely what I'm going to do is I'm going to break all of induction into at least two videos, if not maybe three, uh, just because I want to try to pace everything out pretty well. So, all right, with all that, let's start talking axioms. I've mentioned things like axioms a lot in class already. Uh, but basically, again, axioms are sort of the fundamental rules that we consider to be just true. So this is actually, we get to talk about the uh, the first examples of axioms that we've seen at all for this entire class. So let's take a look at some of them. First, we can talk about the axiom of infinity. The axiom of infinity, remember that an axiom is a type of theorem. So the axiom of infinity states that there exists an infinite set which can be interpreted as the set of natural numbers. So what we're saying here is that the, the natural numbers are sort of the quintessential set. And we're, we're sort of listing this as an axiom saying that we consider this a fundamental rule that the natural numbers are an infinite set, or at least that there is some fundamental infinite set which can be interpreted to be equivalent to the uh, natural numbers. So this is sort of what an axiom kind of looks like. It's like a very broad rule that gives us a lot of fundamental definitions. So then what we have next are what are called the piano axioms of the natural numbers, you know, axioms of the set of natural numbers. And this actually gives a bunch of rules that define what actually, what the elements are that show up in the natural numbers. So for people who were trying to figure out, okay, well, what's the definition of the natural numbers? Because all I really did was I gave the elements that are in the natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, etc. The piano axioms are actually what define conclusively define the natural numbers. So let's screw them. Let's go uh, through them uh, slowly and talk about what these say. So the first piano axiom states that zero is a natural number. This one's a little bit easy to interpret. All we're saying is that zero is a natural number. But the next one is really cool because it lets us take existing natural numbers and build new ones off of them. So the second one says that if n is some natural number, then n plus 1 is also a natural number. So the way these two rules would work in conjunction is that we would start at 0 being a natural number, and then we say, OK, well, 0 is a natural number. So then 0 plus 1 is also a natural number, which means that 1 is a natural number. Well, now that we know that 1 is a natural number, then 1 plus 1 equals 2 must be a natural number by this rule as well. And then because 2 is a natural number, then 2 plus 1 is 3. That's a natural number, and so on and so on. So these rules actually also help specify uh, why the natural numbers are discrete, because we're basically taking old values and we're adding new ones by adding, we always add 1 to an element to get new uh, value. So because there's always that separation of one between an old element and a new element, 
we have uh that that's that's when we get our words that's when we get our discrete the, the discreteness of the natural numbers now there are actually two more piano axioms and these ones are a little bit uh tricky so let me explain what they mean i'll write them out first the third piano axiom says that if n is a natural number and n is not equal to zero, then n minus one is a natural number. And the fourth one right here says that if n and m are natural numbers and n plus one equals m plus one, then n equals m. Now, these two rules might seem a little bit trivial, trivial at first because, you know, we have all sorts of knowledge that we learn from things like algebra and stuff like that, especially this one. Clearly, if n plus 1 equals n plus 1, then n equals m, right? Well, these rules are actually what help define why we can say that's true. So the, the algebra that we know is partially built off of rules like the piano axioms. So if 1 is a way to get sort of the seed of the natural numbers or the first value of the natural numbers, and 2 is a way to get more natural numbers from existing natural numbers, then what 3 and 4 do is they help us go backwards along the natural numbers. So 3 says, okay, well, from n, we can go to n minus 1, then n minus 2, then n minus 3, all the way back to until we hit 0 again. And 4 is a really important one because it says that if we go backwards, we'll, we will be follow there's exactly one path that could go backwards through the natural numbers. So this is really instrumental in saying that, well, we're not going to have uh, two ways to get, say, from 0 to 7 or 0 to 100 or 0 to any natural number n. There's only one way to get from 0 to n, and that's through traveling along you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so on and so on. So, again, these, these rules may seem a little bit self-evident, but just remember that these rules are very fundamental, and it's because of rules like these why you know all the algebra knowledge and stuff like that. So the reason why these rules seem obvious is because we've really been working with these rules a lot. So I, what I would recommend is just sit and think about these rules for a little bit. Um, this, at this point, it would be a good time in the video to pause it and ask any questions that you have on Piazza to see if uh, there's any way I can help you out, uh, help answer any questions, because the piano axioms are going to be pretty helpful for us to understand what's going on with the rest of this topic. But in short, the piano axioms really just define the natural numbers. All right. So now that we have that out of the way, what I'm going to define is the principle of mathematical induction. Of mathematical induction, which in and of itself is a theory. Uh, it's a theory that has to do with the uh, natural numbers as well. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at this. All right, so <clears throat> this is what's known as the principle of mathematical induction. It's a theorem that basically, if you have some subset of the natural numbers that satisfies a couple of properties, then we can say that that subset actually equals the natural numbers. So let's take a look at it. Um, we're going to say that S is a subset of the natural numbers. If S satisfies these two properties here, that zero is an element of S, and that if some number n is an s, then n plus 1 is an s. The principle of mathematical induction states that s actually is entirely equal to the natural numbers. The reason why is because if we know that s is a subset of the natural numbers that contains 0 and follows this rule, well, then we know that 1 must be in here because 0 was in here. And then if 1 is in here, then 2 is in here. If 2 is in here, then 3 is in here. If 3 is 4 is in there, and so on and so on. So these two rules by themselves, they actually give us uh, that S has all of 
uh, and uh, has all of the elements that the natural numbers does. All right, so this all leads us into our next style of proof, which is basic, which is called a proof by induction. Basically, what we have is we have some predicate p that takes in natural numbers and gives us a truth value, right? And then we have a set S, which is every X in the natural numbers such that P of X is equivalent to true. So every X that you can put into this predicate that gives out a, a, a true proposition. What we want to do is we want to use the principle of mathematical induction right here to prove that our set S, this set S here, satisfies the properties in the principle of mathematical induction, which means that S is equivalent to the natural numbers. So the first thing I want to point out here is because of the way we've defined S, we know already that S must be a subset of the natural numbers. There's not going to be any X in here that is not a natural number just because of the set builder notation right here. So we already know that S is a subset of the natural numbers, which this condition is satisfied. Then what we want to do is we want to show, actually, we basically want to show these two rules are correct. And in order to show these two rules are correct, based on how we define the S up here, we basically show that, okay, well, if P of zero is true, that means that zero is an S. And if we can show that this is true, that if P of K is true, then P of K plus one is true. That means that k being in s implies that k plus 1 is in s. So therefore, if we show that these two things are correct given our predicate here, this means that s equals the natural numbers. In other words, this predicate is true for every single natural number. So that's the idea of proof by induction. And again, this is another point where if you have any questions right now, uh, definitely please ask them before continuing on with the video, uh, just because it can be a little bit tricky. If, if you're having trouble with these types of, uh, with this reasoning right here, then you definitely want to stop here and ask a lot of questions. Um, I can say it already that I'm going to extend the deadline on this video because induction is such a tricky subject to get. Okay, so when we're actually writing out a proof by induction, we, tend, we generally tend to follow a certain structure, which involves uh, having three main parts, which we'll actually designate in the proof. And I'll show you what that looks like in some examples. So what we have here is first we'll save the basis step. What that basically means is this is the step where we show that P of zero is equivalent to true, which means that we're showing that zero is an element of our set S. Then we have our inductive hypothesis. This is basically where we just state this part because what we're going to do to, uh, to satisfy condition two, we basically just need a direct proof of if P of K is true, then P of K plus one is true. So we're going to be assuming that P of K is true. So we'll actually state that assumption right here in the inductive hypothesis. And then in the inductive step, we basically just do a direct proof or a, uh, honestly you can also do a proof by contradiction or a proof by contraposition, but direct proof is the most common that you'll see. But uh, so I'll just scratch this out and I'll just do a proof of the statement P of K is equivalent to true implies P of K plus one is equivalent to true. And I'll just put down here direct contrapositive uh, contradiction and so on. You're allowed to use any of these to show this, whichever one works, as long as you show that if you assume P of K is true, then you can assume that P of K plus one is true. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'll bring up an example. Uh, I'll bring up an example and we can actually see this structure and also the principles of proof by induction put into practice. Okay, so here's our first theorem. Basically, what this is asserting is that for all n in the natural numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus all the way up through 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n, we're saying that this equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. Basically, what we're trying to show is that for all n uh, in the natural numbers, this whole 
equivalency is true. So let's rewrite this really quick to work with it a little bit easier. Basically, we're saying that for all n in the natural numbers, 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the first plus 2 squared plus all the way up plus 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. So this whole thing right here is going to become our p of n. p of n equals this statement here. What we're trying to show is that p of n is true for all n. Uh, so we want to show that this whole thing is true. I'm going to write down want to show to really uh, nail down that we don't know for sure that it is true yet, but that this is what we're trying to prove, basically. So we have our P of n. We need to, it, it might be helpful to talk about what our S is as well. So basically, our set S is going to be equal to the set of all natural numbers. So n in the natural numbers such that 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the first plus 2 squared plus all the way up through 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that s in the natural numbers such that this whole thing is equivalent to true. I guess I could have left it how it, how it uh, was, but we'll just keep it like this for now. So if we want to do a proof by induction, what we have to do is show that, well, this statement is true for n equals 0, and then show the proof that if this is true for some natural number k, then it is true for some natural number k plus 1. And what that will then mean is that, OK, well, we know it's true for 0, so then it must be true for 1. And if it's true for 1, then it must be true for 2. And if it's true for 2, it must be true for 3, and so on and so on. We could just do that as many times as we want and reach, you know, some pretty inconceivable natural numbers. And yeah, theoretically, that would just, actually not theoretically, uh, actually, it is proven that this will uh, show that it's true for all natural numbers. So let's take another look at the proof by induction structure. Uh, the basis step is basically showing that P of zero is true. So let's do that. So in the proof, the way we'll start off a proof by induction here is we'll say something like proceed by induction over n. And it's like, all right, now we need to show that basically S here satisfies all the uh, everything that we need for the principle of mathematical induction. So. We'll start off with the basis step. And what, what we can do here is we can just say, uh, let n equals 0. What I want to do then is I want to look at the left side of this equation when n equals 0, and then do a bunch of math, and eventually end up at the right side of the equation when n is 0. The reason why I want to do that and not say this equals this when n equals 0 is because then we would be assuming already that it's true for n equals 0, which we're not allowed to do. So I'm going to start off here. I'm going to substitute in uh, n equals 0 and then do some math. So 2 to the 0 is basically going to be the left side of this. 2 to the 0 will equal 1. And then this will equal 2 minus 1. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make uh, what I have here look like this side of the equation. So then 2 minus 1 is going to equal 2 to the 1 minus 1, which is then equal to 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1, since n equals 0. So what I have right here is that 2 to the 0 equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. It looks very much like the uh, the equation up here. So 
I would say that this is a good way of doing the basis step is starting at the left side and then eventually reaching the right side. Or if you prefer, starting at the right side here and then eventually reaching the left side down here. Whatever whatever floats your boat, honestly, that part works. As long as you don't say, oh, let 2 to the 0 equal 2 to the 1 minus 1. That's, uh, that's an issue. Anyway, so this is the basis step. So we can say, thus, the statement is true. for n equals zero. And then implicitly we can say to ourselves, oh, well that means p of zero is true, so zero is in S. What I actually want to point out is that we won't actually be talking about the set S in the, ex in the actual proof because that ends up overcomplicating things. Rather, the set S right here is a good tool to use to, to, familiarize, to familiarize ourselves with the problem and how we can use proof by mathematical induction to solve that problem, but we don't need to actually talk about S in the proof, and we probably actually shouldn't talk about the set S in the proof. So that's the basis step. Now, if we head back over to proof by induction, the next thing we need to show is that if we assume P of K is true, then we want to show that P of K plus one is true. So the inductive hypothesis is the next big section that we're including, and we're basically stating the assumption that we will make in order to say that, okay, well then this must be true. So you can think of it as you're writing out the first line of your direct proof, basically. So inductive hypothesis The reason why it's called an inductive hypothesis is because it's the hypothesis that we use in order to do the in order to prove that the inductive step is correct. So our hypothesis being our the assumptions that we're going to make. So the inductive hypothesis in this case, we're going to say uh, we basically want to say that this equation is true, but I'm going to say sorry that this equation is true, but I want to use some n equals k. The reason why I want to do that is I want to use n as a more sort of loose, like, oh, well, this is a placeholder for a natural number. Whereas I want to say that k is a constant natural number that we know that the uh, hypothesis, that we know that this equation is true for. So we'll say, let k be a natural number. Suppose... 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 squared plus all the way up through 2 to the k minus 1 plus 2 to the k plus 2, uh, sorry, equals equals 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. So this is how we're going to start off our inductive. Uh, basically, this is the assumption that we're going to use in order to prove our inductive step. So then finally, in our inductive step, we're just writing a proof that if we assume P of K is true, then we can show that P of K plus one is true. So the way we can do that, we don't need to rewrite this part anymore. We can already just, we, we can basically consider that, oh, well, we've started the proof at this point right here. And then the inductive step is just finishing off the rest of the proof. So the inductive step What we'll do is we already have this assumption. Suppose 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 squared plus all the way through 2 to the k minus 1 plus 2 to the k equals 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. What I want to do now is because I want to show that this is true for n equals k plus 1, we'll, we'll start with that. Let n equal k plus 1. And I want to say consider... 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 squared plus all the way up through 2 to the k minus 1 plus 2 to the k plus 2 to the k plus 1. So this is the left hand of the equation if we do p of k plus 1. What I want to do is I want to show that this is equal to the right hand of the equation when we do p of k plus 1. That this is equal to 2 to the k plus 2 minus 1. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm starting off with the left side of that equation. I'm going to do a bunch of math, and I'm going to get to the right side of the equation. What's nice about starting off with this side of the equation 
is that right here, all of this is covered by the inductive hypothesis. So we know that this whole thing equals 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1 because that's the assumption that we made in our inductive hypothesis. So we can actually do that substitution right away. So by the inductive hypothesis, or I'll abbreviate that as IH, by the inductive hypothesis, this equals 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1 plus 2 to the k plus 1. I just substituted everything that I underlined in blue with all this stuff up here. So then I'll start doing some algebra here. So this will be equal to 2 times 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. We're just combining like terms here. We're saying that there's two of these. So it's, yeah, algebra. And then this is going to equal 2 to the k plus 1 plus 1 minus 1. The reason why I left it up like this is because n equals k plus 1. So really, this just uh, looks like 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. So I'm actually going to leave it in this form because really we've done all we need to show that p of k plus 1 is true once we assume that p of k minus 1 is true. So really, once we get here, we can say that thus this statement holds when n equals k plus 1. So going back to proof of mathematical or to the principle of mathematical induction, if our set S is all natural numbers such that this equation is true, what we showed is that 0 is an element of S because that equation was true for n equals 0. And we also showed that if, in this case, if k is an S, then k plus 1 is an S, which that was our whole proof right here. Our assumption of p of k being true helped us show that by making this uh, substitution here, it helped us show that p of k plus 1 is true. So because of all that, by the principle of mathematical induction, our set S, our set S up here is completely equal to the natural numbers. So what this means is that we can say, therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, And I'm going to abbreviate this in the future to PMI because uh, it's a lot faster to write. I don't, I, you know, there's a chance of getting carpal, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome soon, uh, especially when I was working up on the board last quarter. My head really started hurting at night. So I, I, I'm going to use as many abbreviations as I can. And hopefully you all don't mind that. We'll say, therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, uh, our, our statement, so I'll rewrite the statement. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus all the way up through 2 to the n minus 1 plus 2 to the n equals 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1 for all n in the natural numbers. And that's our first proof by mathematical induction. So congratulations, you did it. This is the last uh, big proof technique that we'll actually learn, which is uh, super fantastic. It's... Uh, I don't know. I love proof of induction so much. It's super powerful. You can do so much cool stuff with it. Um, I think I mentioned this in at some point. I might have had the last video that I filmed, I'll be honest. I it, It's been a hell of a day since the last video I filmed it now. Uh, but induction and contradiction are the two big graph theory proof techniques. So we'll get a chance to actually prove some things using induction about graphs. Uh, that's actually coming up in the, probably uh, within the next week, actually, we'll get to talk about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hyped for that. Uh, it'll be some really cool stuff. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to go over one more example, actually two more examples. Uh, and after that, we'll call it quits for this video.
Okay, so I miss I misspoke a little bit, but um, really this is going to be the last example of the video. But in order for us to talk about the last example, I have to do a bunch of stuff. So we're going to define the power set of a certain set S. So let's let S be a set. The power set of S is the set of all subsets of S. And we denote this using a fancy script P and the letter S. So again, this whole thing is just, uh, we can define this using set builder notation. Uh, as the collection of all sets T, uh, T being a subset of our universe such that T is also a subset of S. Something like this. It's a little bit clunky, but really we're just collecting every single subset of S into one larger set. So I have a theorem that is not a proof by induction. It's actually a proof by contradiction, but a very brief theorem that will let us uh, basically talk about some of the elements that are in a power set. So this theorem says if we let S just be any set, then the empty set is a subset of S. And we talked a little bit about the logic behind that before, but we haven't been able to show a proof of that until now. And I want to point out there that whenever you see like some sort of empty set is a subset of a set or a set equals an empty set, I'm going to say right away that proof by contradiction is going to be um, the way you want to go. So if you see an empty set, use proof by contradiction. And I'm thinking I might make another video at some point describing how to handle specifically proof by, con uh, proof by contradictions for sets with empty sets. Uh, that or uh, sets being equal to empty sets. That's That or at the very least, I'll be able to talk about it in class. So anyway, what we'll do is uh, if we're trying to prove that the empty set is a subset of some set S, we can suppose otherwise, seeking a contradiction. So if the empty set is not a subset of S, which is what we're supposing for our proof of contradiction, then that must mean that there's some element in the empty set that is also not in S. However, this is impossible because the empty set is empty, so it can't have any element. So that, that's where a contradiction comes in. It contradicts the definition of the empty set. So therefore, the empty set is a subset of S. And I'll put in the QED because I totally forgot to do that. So now, here's an example. Uh, we have the power set of the set 1, 2, and 3. That's just the collection of all possible subsets of the set 1, 2, and 3. So that's the empty set, the set containing just 1, set containing just 2, set containing just 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, because a, a set is a subset of itself as well. And if we count this, we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 subsets in this set, which huh, that's interesting. Eight happens to be two to the third. And there's three elements in this set. You know what that means? Illuminati confirmed. Just kidding. That's not what that means. But it does have to do with this theorem here. So for all the natural numbers n, if we have a set with cardinality n, if we have a set with n elements in it, then we would say that the size of the power set of S is equal to two to the n. So basically, if I have a set of four elements, then the power set will have 2 to the fourth equals 16 elements in it. If I have a set with three elements, then the power set will have 2 to the third equals eight elements, just like so. Uh, so now I didn't throw in all the detail of trying to figure out our, uh, our predicate or like the set that goes with that predicate that we're trying to prove is equal to the natural numbers. And if you want, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do and then follow along with the video if that helps things out. But I'm going to skip all that for now and I'm happy to clarify that in class in person. So for the basis step, remember that we're trying to show that this is true for n equals zero. So what we'll do is we'll let the, the uh, cardinality of s be equal to zero, which means that s has no elements in it. So s is the empty set right here. And that means that the only subset of the empty set is the empty set. So the only element that can be in the power set of S is the empty set, which means that the power set of S 
has only one element in it, so the cardinality is equal to 2 to the 0th power. And thus the statement holds for n equals 0. The inductive hypothesis, uh, remember that this is the beginning of the proof that, uh, oh, where is it? If it's true for p of k, then it's true for p of k plus 1. So that's what I did up here. I'm assuming that it's true for p of k. So we're supposing that if s has k elements, then p of s has 2 to the k elements. And that's the assumption we're going to make. So now, to show that this holds true for uh, n equals k plus 1, what I'm going to do is suppose that s has k plus 1 elements. And I just happen to just name them a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up through a sub k, a sub k plus 1. So yeah, S has K plus one element. So it's what the, this satisfies the uh, assumption that we need in order to prove the theorem. Then what I did was I took some set S prime equals the first K elements from S. And, it's imp and what's important is that I chose the first K elements from S because we can apply the inductive hypothesis to show that the power set of S prime has two to the K elements in it. Now from there, I was able to construct the power set of S using the power set of S prime by basically for every subset of S prime, I uh, added, added that subset to the power set of S and I also added that subset union A sub K plus one, A sub K plus one being the one element that is in S but isn't in S prime. I added that to the power set of S as well. So what this ends up being is this gives us all possible subsets of S because we have all possible subsets of S, S prime plus all the sets with A sub K plus one added in there. And if you want to see how this works for yourself, I'd actually highly recommend seeing how you can go from the power set of one, two, and three to the power set of one, two, three, and four by basically taking all of these sets here, adding them into the power set of one, two, three, four, and then adding all of these subsets union with the set containing four to here and, and see how that cre creates every single subset of one, two, three, four. So that'd be a good exercise if you want help understanding this proof. But basically that's how we can construct P of S so then the power set of S gets two elements for every element of P of S prime. So we can say that the cardinality of the power set of S is equal to two times the cardinality of the power set of S prime, which is two times two to the K, which is two to the K plus one. And therefore by proof and mathematical induction, we have proved our theorem. All right, well, that is all for this video. In the next video, I will be talking about uh, more induction we'll be talking about a special type of induction that actually is a lot stronger. So it's uh, actually named strong induction. And uh, just as a sneak peek of what's going on, strong induction, you know, so the induction that we've used so far only takes advantage of the first and second piano axioms here. So that's what's going on with the principle of mathematical induction is it's only using these two axioms. Strong induction is actually going to take advantage of piano axioms three and four. And that gives us some really cool and exciting things. So I'll see you all then.